Okay, before we get started, um, just an announcement from the Dean of Students. Students, if you have a friend that scanned and left, you might want to let them know that they're getting an absence today. Um, then Caleb with uh, Campus Ministry wants to remind everybody that chapel tomorrow will be back at Hillcrest. Um, and then if you have not told him that you want pizza tomorrow night for dinner, you need to tell him like now because he'll be ordering that right after this. Uh, if you don't tell him, you won't have dinner tomorrow night. Anything else announcement wise? Uh, Josh is going to lead us in a couple of songs and then we'll get going. All right, first let's sing um, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace I will stop right there and then uh, who all here knows above all by a show of hands alright we'll give it a go then above all Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, laid behind a stone, you live to die, rejected and alone, like a rose, trampled on the ground, you took the fall and thought of me above all. All right, we'll sing an old classic. We'll sing A Wonderful Savior. I don't think you guys have any lyrics, and I apologize for that, so uh, we're going to do our best. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the clefts of the rock Where rivers of pleasure I see He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock That shadows a dry thirsty land 
He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burdens away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He gives me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness transported, I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. Morning. There's a couple of different occasions in Scripture where the Apostle Paul said that he was hindered from going to do the work that he wanted to do for Christ. On one of those occasions, he said Satan had hindered him and kept him from going. On the other occasion, he said the Holy Spirit had hindered him from going and wanted to send him uh, somewhere else. So you look at the book of Job, and one of the things that came out of Dr. Ralph Gilmore's lesson last night was things happen, circumstances happen, and we don't have the ability to ascertain sometimes whether that's the influence of Satan or God or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, so I, I don't know what the situation here is. All I know is our speaker has been hindered this morning. I tell our Bible majors all the time, you better always be prepared. And so this is why, right here, because here we are. We're fixing to study something together. Uh, and, and I don't know what yet. So uh, let's pray, and let's see how this thing goes. Dear Most Holy and Righteous Heavenly Father, Father, we are so indeed grateful for your love and your grace and your mercy. We're thankful, Father, for your steadfast kindness. We're thankful for your guidance. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the truths that have been spoken for the last four days here at this college. While we don't always understand everything, Father, we do pray that you will continue to lead us and guide us into all truth, that you will continue to reveal yourself in, to us in powerful ways, that you will help us to accept at least one truth, that you are sovereign and our only hope is in you. Father, as we try to study your word this morning, we just pray that you will fill me with your spirit, that you will guide me in the way of truth, and that something this morning can be spoken to this audience that will help them, encourage them, and strengthen their faith in you. We thank you for your son, Jesus, that makes all things possible. We thank you, Father, for your spirit that intercedes on our behalf. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'll do my best not to get too emotional but today is a very emotional day for my family. 17 years ago today, my daughter died. I preached her funeral. Three days later on my 25th birthday, can't even begin to describe to you the 
pain, the hurt, the questions, the anger, and to this day, the unresolved issues. Yesterday marked 10 years that my uncle died unexpectedly. And I reached out to one of my cousins and just said, I can't believe it's been 10 years. I love you. She sent me a text back and said, you would think after 10 years I'd be used to this now. And all I could respond back was, you never get used to it. 17 years and I still hurt just as bad today as I did that day. And yet when you begin to step back of 42 years of living, that wasn't the first time in my life that I had dealt with pain. I don't know if you can remember this day in your own life, but I came into this world crying. You did too. Because if you didn't, the doctor would smack you on the rear end to make you cry. And if you've ever given birth to a child, what you know is that first scream and cry is what you're looking for. It's what you want to hear. And the harder the scream and cry, the better, because that tends to mean the healthier the lungs are on that infant. When Aslan was born, boy, she came out fiery red on the head and all over, just screaming at the top of her lungs, just looked angry. She still looks angry. <laughs> but in about three months, we're gonna take care of that. My father was a preacher, so my life was spent moving around a whole lot. You go into a new place and you develop relationships and friendships. And then next thing you know, dad comes home and says, boys, sit down, I got something to say. By the time I was 13, I just looked at Dad and said, we don't need to sit down anymore, Dad. Just give it to us. We know what's coming. When I was three years old, and, and I'm serious about this. A lot of people don't think that I, I could do this because a lot of people don't have very many memories from when they were two, three, four years old, but, but I, I do. I've, there are certain things that I still remember very vividly, and I can remember between the ages of two and three, we were living in Center, Alabama, and it was about one or two o'clock in the morning, and I'd woken up to storms, and I came into the living room, and my mom and dad are watching the radar there on our you know, little nine-inch television set, and we're sitting there on the floor, and my dad's sitting in the floor, and cross-legged, I'm sitting in his lap, and of course, I didn't really know what was going on at the time. I didn't know it was weather radar that we were looking at. I just thought, hey, I want to color on the TV with the, all the pictures, and it got really, really bad, and at some point, we walked to the door, and I think it was right after daybreak, and we opened up the door, and there was cars that were turned over from the tornado that had ripped straight through where we lived. And from that point forward, I developed this phobia of storms. And any time I heard thunder, I would have to go and hide, and I would tremble and just completely scared to death because of that traumatic experience when I was two or three years old. I didn't understand a lot growing up, but there was something that I could always sense within my mom and feel within my mom. When I was 11 months old, my sister was born. 
She came into this world with pneumonia. My mother never got to hold her. The doctors took her from my mom and immediately took her to ICU and then air flighted her from Union City, Tennessee to Memphis. She would die two, years, two, two days later. This is one I still can't, I can't get over. When I was 18 years old, my girlfriend dumped me on Christmas Day. That was a good thing. Throughout my life, I can look at just series of events. There was a time when I was young and naive, and then there was a time where I reached a different level that I would consider spiritual maturity-wise. And I, I always just wanted to be a little bit older because when I watched my parents and the way they responded to life events and watched my grandparents, and especially my grandfather, and the way that his presence was, and my great-grandparents, they just had this strength about them. And because of the strength, I didn't know his strength at the time, I just assumed that the older you got, the easier life gets. I was young and naive. That's not the way it is. I envy my grandparents and great-grandparents because they handled the toughness and the pains and the sufferings of life so much more gracefully than I've been able to. I'm not going to lie to you, the last five years have been extremely devastating and torturing for my family. I suffered a nervous breakdown in 2018. Three weeks before Christmas in 2019, my wife and I both lost our jobs on the same day. Then you had COVID that hit. And I'm going to be honest with you, COVID was devastating for a lot of people. COVID was a breath of fresh air for my family. We studied this week from the book of Job. And in Job chapter 3 and verse 23. In a chapter where Job is actually lamenting his very birth, questioning why did God ever allow him to be born? Literally saying to God, I would have been better off stillborn than having to live life at this very moment in time. And he says this in verse 23. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? I'm not a poet. I've tampered a little bit with poetry when I was younger. I was very good at the roses are red type situations. I could have never put it as elegant as what Job did in verse 23, but that is a question that I have pondered for much of my life. I'm a preacher of the gospel. God has provided for my family because I have been convicted from Psalm 119 
that God's word is a light. I have spent the greater portion of my adult life invested in this right here. Because somewhere deep down inside of me, I believe this is light. And yet Job has access to this light. And he says, it's not doing me any good. Despite the light that you've given me, I still cannot see my way out of this. You young people have got to recognize and realize at some point you're going to be confronted with the unfairness of life. Do you want to know why I'm here? You don't know why my wife and I, for the last three years, four years now, have stepped back and spent a lot of time trying to figure out what ministry we want to go into next. Do you want to know why we chose this as our ministry? I don't say this to insult you. I say this for awareness. I do not believe you know what you're up against. And I don't believe that the older generations have done the service that we owe you to prepare you properly for what you're getting ready to confront. Amen. 20 years ago, when I was sitting where you're sitting, if you would have told me that my kids were going to have to deal with the challenges that they're confronted with, I'd have laughed. Never in my mind could I have imagined what you would be up against. You see, Job mentions here this hedge. Satan mentioned the hedge first. And it's interesting that Satan is aware of the hedge, Job is aware of the hedge, but both of them also understand the hedge in a very similar position. Because Satan says... The only reason, God, that Job worships you is because of this hedge of protection that is around him. That's Satan's conclusion. If you remove the hedge, Job will not worship you any longer. And here Job sees this hedge of protection around him, and now it seems as though he's questioning the very same thing. God, I don't know if I can do this. Where is my hedge? I've become dependent upon this hedge in my life. And now it's gone. And now all of this light is still here. But I'm blind. You know, it doesn't matter how much light you have in a room. A blind person is still in darkness. And that's Job. And I'm going to speak real. I'm going to speak raw. And I'm going to speak honest with you young people this morning. The mission here at CRC is to expose you with as much light 
as possible. Staff here, faculty alike, we're not naive. We know some of you don't care much about chapel. We know some of you may dread this week of lectureships where you have to come and sit in this gym and listen to a bunch of old people that seem to be completely disconnected and unintuned to what you experience in life. But you know why we do these things? To expose you to the light. And yet some of you are walking around in blindness. We're aware of that. You know, kittens come into this world with their, light, their eyes sealed shut. For the first two weeks, all they do is kind of feel their way around trying to find the warmth of their mama. And if they get too far away where they can't feel that warmth, they'll begin to, to whimper and, and whine to get the attention of the mother. And they'll find their way to that mama and then they'll begin to nurse for nutrition, but I believe also for soothing. They can't see. But they know as long as they can be close to mama, they're going to be okay. And what's interesting is when you watch mama, for the first day or two, she's soaking it all in, and she's purring. But when it's time to wean them, she's a true parent. Get away from me. I don't want to be touched anymore. But about two weeks in, those eyes begin to just pop open just a little bit. Just, just a little, little light in. And so when they have this little bit of light, they can start distancing themselves just a little bit from mom. Now, they don't have a clear view. They don't have a clear perspective yet, but, but they can see just enough to know the proximity of where mom is, and so they can kind of feel and kind of separate themselves out just a little bit. And then once those eyes pop up open completely, then, then they can go. That's my prayer. For you young people, not that you're blind permanently, but that your eyes are sealed, and over time, I just hope that they'll just open just a little bit to light. Where the seed of God's word can sink into your heart and take root. So that over time, as your eyes begin to open, you can have that comfort and security in God. So that you reach a point where God doesn't just have to hold you tight and close into his bosom all the time, that he can actually open up his arms so that you can separate yourself from him in order to go out and fulfill your purpose for him. See, that's what God wants. He wants a relationship with you, but he also wants to develop you to the point where he can nudge you out so that you can do something with your life it's not only beneficial for you but it's beneficial for the people around you it's beneficial to the kingdom don't run 
from the light. You know, I'm going to tell you something. When you graduate college and you get your first job, you're you're going to think, oh, I've got money. I'm going to go out and get myself a nice place, get myself a nice car, and I'm going to enjoy my freedom. And I graduated from preaching school. I moved to Columbia, Mississippi, making $500 a week. That was almost as much as my dad was making. That was good money to a 20-year-old single guy. Went down to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and started car shopping and wanted a Toyota Tacoma, pre-runner truck. And saw one that I really, really wanted and started thinking to myself, all right, how do I get this truck for as cheap as possible? So I went to the car lot across the street. They had a uh, Ford tracks, I think, Ford tracks or something. I don't know if y'all remember these, little, little bitty truck. And I asked the people, I said, can I take this for a test drive? And they said, sure. I was still young, and so the salesman was like, I, I'll have to ride with you. I said, yeah, it's fine, come on. And he hops in the truck and I take it across the road to the Toyota place. I wanted them to know I was serious about buying their truck. If they weren't going to sell me this truck, I was going to buy one from their competitor across the road. Guy comes out and says, I tell you what. If you'll pay $100 more than what we pay for this truck, it's yours. I said, I'll sign the papers. Now it's time to get an apartment. Found a place for $450 a month. That's one week's paycheck. My new truck note, $300 a month. Insurance, because it's I like to speed, $300 a month. That's more than two paychecks. Half my month's salary already gone on these two places. That's life, folks. But I was so proud to have that, that new place. Got everything set up and got snuggled in on the couch and had a little wall heater fireplace. And man, it was so nice. and. Night I got up and went into the kitchen. It was dark, threw on the light. 10,000 roaches. A yellow floor that was black. <laughs> Shot out everywhere. I was like, well, wasn't expecting that. So I go to bed, get away from the kitchen. One o'clock in the morning. Get stirred, aroused from my sleep, feel something on my face. Anybody in here from southern Mississippi by chance? Okay, see, in Arkansas, you don't have cockroaches. You don't know what a roach is. Southern Mississippi, these roaches are six inches long, and I'm not joking. <laughs> Catch sharks on them things. Six inch roaches crawling down my face. I ain't sleeping here. Go to the living room, get on the couch to find five or six more roaches crawling all over me. The next day, I go to Walmart and I pick up all these bug bombs. And whatever it said was what you were supposed to use, I times it times three per room. Had, it, was a, it was a triplex, so I had people living on each side, and really what it was was it was one house that they had divided into three living locations. So I could get to, I was in the middle, so I could get to either one. And I knocked on these people's doors and I said, hey, you can do whatever you want to. I just want you to know I'm fixing to set off a whole lot of bug bombs and just wanted you to know they may be coming underneath the doors into your apartment. Oh, thanks for letting us know. I came back six hours later. Boy, it looked like shag carpet throughout the house with the roaches. And it didn't fix the problem and I lived there for a year. Some of you are like those roaches. The light comes on and you take off running from the light. The 
question is, who am I, Job's narrative? And everybody this week has talked about Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar and Elihu and Job, God and Satan. It doesn't really rem- it doesn't really matter who you identify with the closest. This is what matters. And this is what this whole week has been about. And I hope that this is the one thing, the one thesis that you take away with you for the rest of your life. Are you ready for it? At the end of time, you will not be judged based upon what has happened to you. You will be judged solely on how you responded to it. The intensity of Job's suffering came as a result of him trying to stand on his own merit and his own two feet. As a result, Satan crushed him. And when Christ returns, if you try to stand in his presence on your own merit, Satan will crush you. Your only hope is in Jesus Christ. I have been a believer my whole life in the sense of believing in God. I have been a believer in a Christian sense since I was nine years old. And if I wanted to look at my life from a refining negative standpoint, which we ones do, I would tell you that a lot of my life has sucked. It's been painful. It's been unfair. And it's easy to get to that place, and that's where Job got to in his life. I can't tell you just because you believe in God and believe in Jesus, life is going to get easier or be easy. The reality is, some of you are going to have children that are going to die. Some of you are going to come, and you're going to get married, and you're going to go through a divorce. Some of you are going to deal with chronic illness. Most of you are going to deal with debilitating mental illness, according to studies and statistics. All of you will experience an unfairness in life. And my point of this is not to discourage you. It's not to crush your hopes and your dreams, but to prepare you. And the question is going to become in that moment, how are you going to respond How are you going to react? It may never get better here in this world, but we have to believe that the return of Christ, it will be better. Everything will be restored to its proper order. Perfection will once again permeate. That's the option that you can only find in Jesus Christ. 
And the question becomes, do you know him? Have you identified yourself with him? Do you know in 1 Peter chapter 4 that Peter says to the Christians, suffer in Christ Jesus? Do you recognize that that's what baptism is all about? That that's the symbolism behind it? When you go down into the water, you're immersing yourself to put to death self why? Because your self is going to be crushed in life. And only Christ has the power to raise you up. And if you've never been baptized, I can promise you this right now. If you will fully believe in Jesus Christ and trust him, when you're baptized and you come out of that water, you will never in your life feel more refreshed than you will in that moment. More alive, more pure. But here's the second reality. Get ready for it. Because then Satan comes. Then he really comes. Do you know when Jesus was immersed and he came out of the water, it's the first time in Scripture that we have God acknowledging Jesus as the Son of God. This is my son. This is my child. And immediately the Holy Spirit leads him away into the wilderness to be tempted and tested by the devil. How will you respond? Where will you put your confidence? Where will you put your trust? It's not about who are you in the narrative of Job. It's about who are you. But if you fall into the second category, whose are you? That means you're a child of God. And while it may appear that this hedge of protection is no longer around you, the reality is it's always there. Because God's purpose is not to preserve you for this life, but to preserve you for the life to come. And the more you suffer in this life, Father, fulfill your promise from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8. Sustain your people. For we're hurting, we're suffering, we're struggling, we're challenged. Sustain us in these moments. And bring us into your presence to experience your glory forever. Through your Son, Jesus, with the intercession of the Spirit, we say, Amen. Okay, just a couple of quick announcements. Announcement number one. For the Bible majors, please meet me up here at the stage as soon as uh, chapel is over so we can discuss a few things. Uh, number two, students remember that Spirit of America is tomorrow night. Um, and I think they're still looking for some volunteers. And if I was informed correctly and if I remember correctly, there's going to be a meeting at 2 o'clock today here in the gym. So if you're going to be helping tomorrow, serving tomorrow, whatever, Please be here at the gym at 2 o'clock today for instructions. And also, there may be some things that we need to go ahead and do uh, today. Anything from the dean? Uh, faculty, do you have any announcements? I don't know if I'm getting a high five from Coach Perkins or a stop. Everybody stay here. So nobody go to class. Everybody stay right here. Um, I don't know, hold on to your seat. Uh, when I was in elementary, they told us to climb under our seats. I don't know what good that's going to do with the plastic chair, but whatever. I think that's all that we have. I do want to say once again to you students, thank you, thank you, thank you for being so respectful. 
as well as paying such good attention throughout the lectureships this week. I've been told on several occasions this is one of the best ones that we've ever had, and that's largely in part because of you and your participation, so thank you.